Thank you. Thank you very much. So the title of my presentation is uh, is very long. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Uh, I, I put it in 2019 when the conference was supposed to be. I will talk about uh, the bear and the beast. This is what you see here is a, dam a damage on an apiary made by uh, brown bears in the Polish Carpathian. But uh, rather than just focusing on this example, I will try to use it to uh, gain some ecological insights into the occurrence of wildlife damage on agriculture and livestock and uh, see how we can use these insights to better inform uh, conflict mitigations. So uh, let's frame the problem. I was supposed to call this farmer Manolo, but now we have <laughs> the elephant of Lydia was Manolo, so we need a, another name for him. How is, how is he going to? Manu. OK, so we have Manu here. He's, he prefers to be in harmony with his sheep and dog in this beautiful landscape rather than finding one of his sheep killed by a bear or a wolf or, or any other predator because this of course is for him implies a big emotional loss and also economical so what can we do to avoid this type of problems uh, mapping the risk of wildlife damage here yeah? uh, this will inform us which areas of the landscape are more vulnerable for damage and where can we invest in prevention, which is very important because uh, resources for conflict mitigation are very limited or very, 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 very limited. So knowing where we have to invest the, the money is always good. Very fast, how it works. This is an example from uh, the United States with uh, wolf predation on uh, sheep. So they use uh, presence and absent data of the predation locations and they model it as a response of the of different predictors like forest cover for instance and based on the coefficient of the models there is a prediction of the risk that is projected across the landscape here the darker the red is the higher the risk and then there are some areas that are classified as uh, uh, safe because they have a very low probability of damage yeah so uh, Mapping uh, the risk comes also with challenges. Yeah? If we understand uh, this as the use of an anthropogenic food resources by animal, we can frame it into the theory of uh, uh, resource selection, which uh, is a process understand to be uh, scale dependent and hierarchically uh, spatial. Here we see the location of four apiary damage by bears in uh, the Polish Carpathians. These are the yellow dots, yeah? And if you see in the large scale, on the big plot of the left, these uh, four locations are surrounded by forests. So forest is a strong predictor at that scale. But in a finer scale, we don't see the forest to be a big predictor. There would be different predictors that are good at this scale. But yet, to have these damages happening in these particular locations, we need to have this amount of forest in the broad landscape context. Yeah? What happened that generally risk mapping uh, is uh, done, not always, but generally at one given scale or resolution. So to overcome this uh, problem, we design a, a multi-scale modeling framework uh, where we propose to model the risk of damage at three different scales that based on scale specific hypotheses and then produce a predicted uh, risk map uh, at each of the scales and integrate these risk maps at the finer resolution to, to produce a, what we call a scale integrated risk map. So, we tested this model with the case of uh, brown bear damage to apiaris. Here you see the location of damaged apiaris from 2010 to 2015 in the Polish Carpathians. The blue line delimits the, limits the brown bear distribution, and the green color is the forest uh, where they live and move, similar to what uh, Lydia was showing. Uh, this is the 
dirty business we are talking about. So here you see a bear rolling a, a beehive, looking for the larvae, because they, it's not only about the honey, they also go for the larvae. This is in April, you see, they, they are full of bee larvae there, which is rich protein. These are the apiaris. They look beautiful, but of course, a beekeeper doesn't want to find that. And it can also look like this, which is a little bit more dramatic. Um, so we apply the framework. We name three different scales. The first one, the broad one, is the landscape scale, in a five kilometer resolution. The intermediate one, we call it the lo local scale, at the one kilometer resolution. And then the fine scale, we call it the household scale and we use the APRS GPS coordinates and we uh, predicted at a 250 meters resolution. So these are nested uh, resolutions. Very fast, I will go through the results. Uh, at the landscape scale, we found that the probability of uh, damage, which is the risk, uh, increases with the probability of APRI and the probability of bear, which are related to the cover of agriculture and the cover of forest, respectively. At the local scale, we found that the risk increase with the length of forest edge. And at the fine scale resolution, the household scale, we found that the apiaries that were located in more remote areas, so close to forests and with no buildings around, had a higher risk, which tell us that bears avoid uh, humans, similar to what Lydia was showing with the with the elephants that they hide in the forest, no, after they they do the the they create problems, let's say. So based on these results, we predicted and projected across the landscape the, the the risk at each scale and integrated it at the finer resolution. This is the uh, the, the scale integrated map is the big one on the right, the darker the orange color, the higher the risk, and then this uh, gray color are places with very low probability, so we classify them as uh, a safe landscape. And this turns out to be good for management because when we rescale it to the management scale, which is the the, the landscape scale, five kilometer resolution, and compare it with uh, a single scale uh, risk map, we find that the sensitivity increase. So here you see uh, false and true positives, and uh, the amount of f uh, f sorry, false negative and true positive. So the amount of this false negative decreases uh, when we rescale this scale integrated risk map, which translate into how we call the farmer Manu. So these are 11 manus less angry here <laughs> in the case of this data. Late, uh, finally, we wanted to answer this question is if the broad landscape context can influence the probability of damage at the finer scale. For that, we uh, took sub two subsets of data at the finer scale. So damage and undamaged apiaris. The undamaged are the red dots. And one subset were, sorry, uh, APR is located in a risky landscape, and the other were located in a safe landscape. And we modeled them at this fine uh, resolution based on the best predictor, uh, which was the number of buildings in a 200 meters radio. And we found that uh, an APR located in a safe landscape uh, can have a probability of damage up to three times lower than an apiary with the exact same characteristics at the fine scale, but located in a uh, uh, risky landscape, which uh, tell us that the same as the use of any other resource, uh, wi uh, wildlife damage also is a spatial hierarchical process. So this is good for management, not only because we can identify which areas of the landscape are more vulnerable, but also we can give direct information to the beekeepers in this case. Uh, for instance, there is a 81% decrease in the risk of damage uh, when apiaries are surrounded by 20 houses in comparison to zero houses. So if they don't have the means to install uh, electric fences, they can, with this information, 
try to put the apiaries in places in which they will reduce this probability of damage. And now I will wrap it up. These are the highlights. Uh, wildlife damage occurrence is a complex ecological issue and is modulated by multiple factors that are interacting at different scales. Uh, bear seems to avoid humans, even when using atropogenic foods like the elephants uh, were showing Lydia. And this, we argue that this is due to a trade-off between fear and fitness. So they have to survive and eat, but they also have to survive and not die in, uh, in the hands of humans. Uh, we show that integrated scale risk maps can improve the spatial prediction accuracy uh, and help prevent damage. And finally, uh, we show that this broader landscape context can shape animal response to the immediate environmental characteristics of a farm. And with this, I finish. But before, I would like to thank my co-authors and my funders. And I invite you to read the paper if you are interested or ask me any question. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So we have time for three questions. Who has questions for Carlos? That. Can you hear me? Yes. So if you can risk map, can you then prevent the bears from coming into these areas more effectively? I mean, it's a very large area. They're very large animals. They sneak in at night. You know, it's like elephants. It's, it, can you actually minimize the risk? Yes. So the first thing we would always try to advise for is uh, installing electric fences and maintain them. Because very often it happens that they are installed and then they are abandoned, like if this was a magical thing that will be working there as a transparent shield. This doesn't work like this. They have to cut the grass below, and they have to be sure that the batteries are working. Because sometimes these fences are installed, but the bears pass, pass through them. Yeah? But there are also these small uh, management actions they can also take. So luckily, uh, beehives, in, especially in this area, uh, the, sometimes the exploitations are small. So there are four or five beehives, and they are relatively easily easy to move to different places. So if they have a map where the probability can be a little bit smaller, they can decrease this, this, this risk. I, I would like to say we made a, a report in Polish and provided it to the Wildlife Administration in Poland with a shape file. Uh, so they have all the spatial information with the hope it can be useful for them. Unfortunately, we are not in, in charge of implementing that. But we try, uh, our intention at least is good, and we try to, to inform them to, to, to implement this. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, really interesting. Um, since we've been hearing about uh, different ways of doing insurance schemes, maybe, um, I was wondering whether there's a way of doing um, where the farmers have an insurance scheme where that money that they put into insurance goes towards having beehives away from, you know, um, communities and, you know, uh, sort of in bare habitats in a way so mm -hmm. that they can have access to honey or and other things uh, without having them to come to it. I mean, that's a might be a slightly random idea. Mm -hmm. Might be a terrible idea, I don't know. No, um, but uh, just thinking about, yeah, insurance and trying to, uh, you know, uh, avoid them having to come at all if you give them a, a, a small source mm -hmm. away from people. So um, how it works here is uh, there is a compensation program running for 15 years or more. And when uh, there is uh, when a beekeeper goes to their exploitation and find there is a damage, they call the administration, they verify the damage, look for bear uh, evidence, and then they compensate. And eventually, sometimes, 
they can provide uh, electric fences, like different preventive measures. So it's not insurance-based, it's rather, it's rather reactive, and uh, we argue in different studies that this may not be the best always, maybe in some cases yes, but this can perpetuate the occurrence of, of damage when you just pay what is happening instead of trying to reduce. So an insurance-based program would probably, I don't know, but I, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if I see that it's more effective in that way because they will say, yes, you will get it, but you have to show that you are doing, like you have your checklist done with all the best practices. No? So. Let's give him an applause. Thank you.